it's fine. Okay, Monique, why don't you say, actually, why don't you say who you are and it, okay. maybe you can guide us actually a little bit so that we can get going since it's really about you and, and your business that we're even here. Uh, I love it that you're taking charge and you should just run the whole meeting. Um, so you have full, <laughs> you have full um, ability, obviously, to do that. But yes, I'm Monique DiGiorgio, co-owner of Table to Farm Compost. And we're here today to talk a little bit about the business, how we got up and running, um, answer questions from folks, including, I think, two other states that have interest in maybe starting something similar. So we thought we would record it. And then that way, anyone who's interested in learning more about our business model can just find out more on the video or they can contact us afterwards and then I'm here with my partner Taylor Hansen who should introduce himself next. Hey um, I'm Taylor Hansen um, yeah I want to echo Monique's sentiment sorry it took us so long to get back to you um, so thank you guys for being so patient um, and um, yeah looking forward to adding value uh, to the compost process and kind of I don't know, answering any questions that you guys have and um, hopefully saving you guys some headache because Monique and I have had a lot of that and there's a lot of logistical stuff. So um, hopefully we can help um, guide you in the right direction. Beautiful. Um, well, we are in Tulsa, Oklahoma and I am Tamara Labak. I'm actually a DEI consultant and a, a backyard chicken farmer. And um, my wife is a minister. Oh, she can introduce herself. Uh, Bonnie Lavac. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, and I'm a pastor here in Tulsa, a church I started six years ago. And um, we've been home, 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 home during this pandemic, <laughs> doing a lot of things from home. So good to be here. <laughs> and we got really excited about this and reached out to um, Monique and Taylor because we went out and sat on a patio one day having food at a local restaurant. We still can do patio dining. And I was like, oh my gosh, we want to do this composting. All oh, this food has been going to waste. And then I was like, oh my God, I have the greatest name. <gasps> Table to farm. And I was oh, like, funny. oh, there you are. You already exist. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Tell me how you did this. So that's kind of why we're here. It's because we got excited about getting together. That's awesome. And what does DEI stand for? Oh, I'm sorry. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I, I do diversity, equity, inclusion work um, with corporations, nonprofits, government agencies. I do coaching and consulting. No way. So we do like workshops for nonprofits? Yes, that are I do. Yes, that's what huh. I do for a living. Yes. Oh, that's very cool. Because my <laughs> other hat is as the director of Local First Foundation, and we work on local self-reliance, building an economy that values people, the planet, and prosperity for everyone. And we've talked yeah. a lot about equity, and I'm on the board with the Creative District, and they t I think they found someone to do a training locally, but I've been looking for someone like that for Local First. So anyway, we should connect. So we can talk about that offline. I do basically trauma-informed diversity, equity, and inclusion um, training and and uh, consulting right. coaching. Very, very cool. Hannah, <laughs> tell us who you are. Um, I'm Hannah. I also work for Table to Farm. Right now, I do social media and some of the other communications and educational stuff. Oh, and awesome. I would say I am a. Uh, full bore believer in compost and I'm super interested particularly like in the inter intersectionality between environmental and social work that um that compost can bring awesome that's <laughs> great all right thank, thank you I this is brand new to me so um while Tamara's typing I'm just gonna <laughs> fill in the blanks and if we could go with Karen is that okay can, can Karen go next sure hi um my name's Karen um I'm from Cedar Park, Texas, which is a town close to Austin. And I've always been interested in composting. I, uh, the only experience I really have is my own compost pile in my backyard, but <laughs> there's a huge need for it. It just kills me to see food just being thrown out when it can be made into something valuable. So I've, I've been tinkering with the idea of um, starting a composting business for a while, and I just wanted to reach out and see how other businesses have done this. And, and I really appreciate everybody's time, by the way. This is really generous of you. So, <laughs> so but that, that's it for me. <laughs> and is it Yini? Yes, it's Yini. Hi. Yini. Um, 
I'm Ini, and then I am from, uh, I'm actually from San Diego. I'm just, uh, you know, visiting Durango um, mm -hmm. since this summer. And then around this summer, you know, uh, my partner and I decided just to take a year off and then rethink about what we want to do. So my specialty is in operations and the project management. And then my whole career, I worked in finance industry, but it's, it's like, you know, sustainability, that's the area where like I have my heart to. And so, mm -hmm. and then uh, when I was in Durango and I found out about Table 2 Farm and then Local First. So, and I just emailed, you know, um, somehow found Monique as well, and then just started sh uh, shadowing her since last Friday. So, uh, and it's just a program like I, I live in San Diego in the condo, and then I've been, you know, struggling with like setting up a composting my, on, on my balcony. And uh, it's just something like, I feel like, why don't we do it everywhere? It's such a good idea. So uh, I'm trying to learn and then just to, to see like, you know, uh, what the business is, um, um, the area that, that the do is working for them and the area that's not working for them and just to see like, you know, if there's anything I can help um, in the process as well. Fantastic. Um, so I don't know if you have things that you automatically want to share with us. We have lots of questions. I have some resources that I've looked up that I'd be willing to share with everybody on the call, but I, we are really interested in learning from you. Um, uh, and I, it sounds like everybody's kind of in different places, but at the same time is interested in kind of leaning into starting a composting company, right? And we are very interested in that. And I'm interested in everything from how much land do we need to what headaches did you go through that, that we need to know about? And who are your core clients? Is it people or is, is it individuals or restaurants and kind of, so I think maybe just talk about the business and we'll, we can interrupt you and ask questions later. Yeah, that sounds great. And maybe what Taylor and I can do is a bit of a history, which would be great to capture on the recording as well. Yeah. Um, and that kind of helps, I think, understand this particular business model, which is really more like a bootstrapping business model, I think, out of necessity. So uh, Table to Farm Compost was started not by myself or Taylor, but by David and Emily Golden in 2016. Uh, David in particular was feeling, I think, the same way that everybody on this call is, which is seeing, you know, food go into the trash. It's such a waste, not only from a kind of climate and carbon perspective, that now you've got this rich organic material going into a covered landfill, creating methane, but also from like a, I guess you could say equity kind of food justice standpoint, like people could be eating this. So, and I think he did some dumpster diving before he started Table Farm, which gave him quite a few points in my book. I thought that was pretty impressive. So he literally started with um, a truck and a five gallon bucket, a green one in particular for a little bit of marketing. His uh, now wife, who is really, I think, amazing with logos and marketing and building websites and stuff, even though that's not her job. Um, they did all of that themselves, like the logo, I'm pretty sure was designed by Emily and they just started going. Um, I was around in Durango at that time, just cheerleading them from the sidelines. I composted at my house, so I didn't use the service, but just was like, man, you guys, this is such a great need. And, you know, he shared with me um, when I bought the business a couple years later that the first six months was really hard, you know, and we're a small community. La Plata County is about 60,000 people, maybe 57,000. Durango's 20,000, somewhere around that. Take that with a grain of salt, but we're a pretty small rural area. He said it took like a good, you know, six months to really even feel like he had subscriptions going. Um, and then after that, once buckets were out, he felt like it really, really started to happen. So I thought that was interesting feedback. The other crazy thing, which um, everyone may not have when they're looking to start something like this, is he had some really incredible web coding background. So he created the whole website, which maybe isn't like fancy from a visual standpoint, but he created all the functionality of like the map that determines which day, you know, is your recycling day. So that's your compost day. How do you sign up? Um, integrating it with Stripe, all of the subscription features, automated emails. He did that all on his own, which, you know, we're, Taylor and I think that if you had to try to pay for something like that, like these are pretty substantial startup costs. So that might be something to think about moving forward. So anyway, he did, he did a uh, table to farm compost for about two years. He had, I think like 119 customers and then he was moving to Carbondale and was about to shut down the business. I, I had another job, but I said, 
famously, if you're desperate, call me, which I think it only took a day for them to call me back. And they were like, come on, yeah. And I kind of dragged my feet for a while because it just seemed like a lot of work, but serendipitously found someone who'd be willing to do the driving and took it on. So that was about two years ago. In the one year where it was just myself um, as the owner, I think we, Taylor probably remembers, we I think went from 119 to two, 290 or something. We, almost a hundred percent growth. And then I was about, I was feeling pretty weary, was about to see if Phoenix Recycling here would maybe do the route for table to farm. Was there another way I could get additional capacity, maybe sell, but keep the business like going, but just not be an owner. And then Taylor convinced me not to do that, which now I'm very happy about. That was about a year and a half ago. So I'll, I'll pause there and let Taylor tell the rest of the history and then where we're at with, um, customers right now and maybe what that profile looks like. Cool. Yes. So about a year and a half ago, um, uh, I grew up in Durango and, um, a colleague of Monique's that's on her board, I played uh, high school tennis with his son and, um, he's pretty connected in the community. He's on the board of like a local co-op and, um, I kind of came from a uh, car dealership background. My folks owned a Honda automobile dealership. and um, But I've always been passionate about sustainability and the outdoors and hunting and um, um, ecosystems and nature. I love being outside. Um, but Monique, um, Tim was this gentleman's name. He introduced me to Monique and uh, Monique and I kind of put our heads together and um I, I made a compelling argument not to sell the business and monique really wanted to keep it as well and she just was super busy and we, we kind of figured out that um together uh we could make it work and grow and um you know kind of fast forward i think we're at 415 uh customers today and um, we've added um, all the, uh, well, we're kind of in talks to add the final two largest grocery stores in our market. And um, we've also received a couple state grants from the Colorado Department of Health and Environment. Um, one that we're working on now, it's an infrastructure grant. So that'll allow us to expand our capacity to collect food scraps, um, it'll no longer be regulated. The amount of material won't be regulated and the type of feedstock won't be regulated. So we'll be able to take everything from like beer mash to food scraps and not have to um, take a, a small, a smaller amount um, uh, like we had to before under old regulations. Uh, we also pick up glass. Um, I guess kind of going back to the grants, we're working on an infrastructure grant now and we received uh, a grant for equipment and the equipment grant allowed us to buy a, uh, a mixer um, so we could mix a uh, final soil product, a glass crusher, so we could crush glass that we actually also pick up on our residential route and add to our soil. The glass is great because it helps with aeration and it's a sustainable piece, we keep the glass in market. So it's a really neat part of the story. Um, and then a couple other small pieces of equipment to kind of help us grow. And um, kind of now, you know, at 400 some customers, we're at this point where we're really wanting to, to up our growth and we're really working with kind of the city and the county to um, increase awareness around compost. And what we'd like to do is Ultimately, the goal would be to have compost or organics recycling be mandatory, right? So it's like, if there's a regulatory push, um, I think that would give us strong legs to stand on, but that's a ways out. Um, but that's kind of the goal, but it's really fun work. So um, yeah, happy to, I think that's a good place to pause. Yeah, I might just add one more thought and then we'll open it up to questions. The regulations or the department's support or lack of support at the state level can make a huge, huge difference to your efforts. And for us, we are very lucky to have 
a very progressive state office that's called Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, a governor who composts at home and supports composting. And we've seen that as a result, regulations um, and incentives come down. So for example, there was a waste reduction policy in 2018 that set waste reduction goals. Then CDPHE prioritized grant funding for uh, rural and um, urban areas to number one, support end markets, and then number two, increase waste reduction. So the fact that we received almost $300,000 in grants from the state of Colorado transform the business. We just wouldn't be where we are today without that. And the end market push I think is pretty interesting because what it does is encourage a closed loop circular system where we can take the compost, create artisan soil, get it back into the marketplace and the state is supporting us to have the equipment, the marketing to get that product back out um, into the marketplace and then ultimately into the ground to sequester carbon. And so they get like that whole circular economy. And they also actually had this really interesting um, business incubator idea that I've always thought would be really fun for other states to do. And I was in the first cohort of that, it was called Next Cycle. And so they chose, I think, 10 businesses that were working on waste reduction, everything from plastics to hemp to organics, and helped them develop their business plans, come up with a pitch, you know, figure out how to get to the next step. And a lot of the artisan soil ideas that we ultimately implemented were first kind of talked about in that in that realm and so for the state to support you know what was at that point just a super tiny business to kind of have the time and expertise to really make this happen um yeah i mean it's completely transformative and i think some of the things colorado is doing it would be really fun to see other states doing it so that's it that's awesome thank you guys that was really great um so you described the the first individual that like started the company and then and it was like okay i've got this five gallon bucket and it was <laughs> green and he went out and he started it and from what we've read it's pretty easy to start and as with most things it's somewhat easy to start but it's another thing to maintain and to stick with it so i basically have like three questions for you what do you love about the business what what are the biggest challenges in the business and what do you wish you had done sooner that you're only implementing now that you thought maybe you could muscle through, but you <laughs> wish that you had done right there, there at the beginning? And why did that original person have to sell or why, what was, was he, yeah. what was his situation? You know, why, mm -hmm. why did he get fired up about it and then, that, you know, leave? And there's all kinds of reasons why that can happen <laughs> and we understand. Yes, those are really good questions. I'll start and then let Taylor jump in and then Hannah too, if you have anything you want to say. But um, in terms of why we do what we do, everybody probably has a little bit of a different bent, but we've spent a lot of time now that we're growing, talking with our team about why we do what we do. And I know for me, I feel like this is one of the most tangible ways I can be a climate activist. And I think Taylor feels the same way. So um, it's been really fun to just have the value drive the interest, which keeps us going to your point, right? Like, how do you, how do you sustain it? Well, if you care so much about it, um, it's easier to sustain. Although I will say that the route itself and just the day to day, like pick, you know, picking up that many buckets, um, being out um, on the route, I think David was feeling after two years, the owner, he was like pretty done with that. And we see that the route drivers, we had one guy who stuck around for a year and probably could have driven the rest of his life, but tends to get uh, to be challenging. And I think because David, I feel pretty certain that he was doing all of that, right? He built the whole business. That part was fun. He liked being on the route, but then as the business grew, I, I remember him saying to me like, yeah, I'm kind of glad not to be in a car and just be behind a desk for a year, you know? So I think that part of it was hard. And then he was moving to Carbondale and, uh, you know, that's far enough away that he really couldn't run the business. So I think one of the challenges we've definitely seen is, you know, when you're small, 
and you can't really necessarily have like seven or eight positions. You're asking one person Monday to Friday to do the driving and it, depending on the personality or what kind of an individual it is, that, that's a pretty hard position to fill. People are excited at first and then kind of, it just becomes, you know, just becomes kind of monotonous. So I think that part's kind of challenge because it's like, oh, we're in the trash pickup service but we don't feel you know we don't feel like that but a lot of what we do is like managing waste right so that part's maybe kind of hard um and then you said what what are the biggest challenges i think for us at some point taylor and i realized like man if we want to grow the business we might need an outside investor because neither of us you know has that kind of money and luckily we were able to get the state to invest in the business to kind of take it to the next level because we went from an exempt facility under state of Colorado regulations to this class three facility. So it's this huge jump, right? So every state probably has its own department that manages this. I would encourage you to look at what that is and how it works. I think that if there was like gradation at the state level, it would make it a little bit easier. It's like almost going from nothing, five cubic yards to like a ton, um, literally tons. So that's the process we're in right now. It would have been kind of sucky to have to get some outside investor. And in terms of what we, could have done sooner. David definitely said to me, when I first took over the business, I immediately registered with Department of Agriculture and CDPHE so that we could sell the compost. And he hadn't done that yet. He was like, oh my gosh, I thought one day I would do that. You've done it. And so like realizing from the very beginning that you're creating an asset and it so folk, he was probably so focused on just getting the business up and running and just getting the buckets into a pile. He wasn't thinking about what to do with the material and so i'd say from the beginning you want to start thinking about that because the sooner you can create that circle and get additional revenue by getting the compost out the door you're probably going to be a little bit of a stronger business model taylor do you have other thoughts before you go, before you oh, yeah. go off of this can you and i understand a little bit about my own backyard but when you're working in this magnitude what is the amount of time that I mean, if you can remember backwards, because you probably have stuff to sell on a regular basis now, but like the amount of time from starting to being able to deliver product, like to deliver that compost. Yeah, when I bought the business, he already had, David had a pretty big stockpile. I, we, we have not run out of compost. This year we got close, but, um, and for every climate, it might be different, but I think we say anywhere from three to six months to really go through the compost process and ours is thermophilic. So making sure you go through the time and temperature profile. If you're managing it and you have bigger piles, maybe you could do that in three months. Um, we, we would wait six months to a season. And um, yeah, so if you're just starting, yeah, you, you probably, you know, the first year you'd maybe be building your feedstocks yeah. before you really had too much to offer. Thanks. Cool. Well, um, thanks, Monique. Um, let's see. Love. I love uh, kind of like the climate stuff. Climate um, implications for our work are really cool. Um, I think that's definitely my driver. Um, I'm excited for kind of the future of sustainable agriculture and the overlap of um, compost collection and climate change and carbon sequestration, I think is like on a large scale. Um, like as a team, we've all done quite a bit of research, but and Monique and I always screw this up. So Monique, you may have to help me here, but um, if uh, food waste were an emitter, I think uh, it would be the third largest emitting, Hannah's smiling too, third largest emitting uh, country in terms of um, greenhouse gases in the, in the, in the world. Um, so I guess like suffice it to say that like food waste is, um, you know, it's like, it's, I don't know, I think maybe Karen said that it's like, well, why, or Tamara and Bonnie, maybe this was you guys, but it's like, well, why is not this already being done? And I think that, um, you know, as we've gotten more into the work, some of that answer has become more apparent, but it still doesn't make a ton of sense. Like there's a huge opportunity and um, I don't know why it's not more widespread or common. Um, but some of the climate implications are really cool. And um, 
So that's definitely uh, kind of what drives me. Um, challenges, I would say I'd echo Monique's um, sentiment as well. Um, there it is. <laughs> um, that, uh, you know, finding a consistent driver has been just kind of small business stuff. Um, and, uh, but we've got a really awesome team right now and, and, um, everyone is like highly capable. Um, and so we feel really fortunate to have received these grants. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just little challenges of growing a business, I guess. It's tough to suss out all the little details, but, um, and I would say, uh, the third question is what we would have done maybe differently and um hmm i'm not really sure i wish i don't know i think it's just kind of slow and steady growth a lot of it i think is around community awareness and it's like how can you work with people in your community to create awareness and maybe like for you guys i don't know a ton about your markets but if they're progressive that will help. Um, no, oh my, right? <laughs> Dang it. Um, well, you I'm know, sorry. You two lesbian ministers running a sustainability company. We yeah. got a lot of strikes yeah. against yeah. us right here. <laughs> well, bullshit. That is bullshit. Right. Total Thank bullshit. you. I love Colorado. Yeah. Mm. Well, I mean, I'm sure you guys will figure out a way to change that paradigm. And, um, uh, yeah, I think really thinking about your strategy a bit, and I, I guess we'd be happy to share from that position too. Like, okay, how can you make it work in your market? I think that's important. Um, and a lot of it is community awareness and education. It's kind of like recycling. You don't know what you don't know, but like compost is more recyclable, has more of a tangible, I mean, arguably, it's it should be more prominent than it is. So um, I think there's a lot of opportunity there as well. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you. And Hannah has some. Yeah, go ahead, Hannah. Oh, yeah, I was just going to kind of tie into that idea. I don't know if anyone has seen the film Kiss the Ground. Um, but that, that for me was a really helpful, just like visual representation of how important sequestering carbon in the ground is and that composting is such an easy, relatively speaking, way to do that. And I think. Um, one of the things I appreciated about that film was um, the viewpoint like from all of the farmers. So just to Taylor's point, like I think what has worked well for us here is that a lot of our current customer base is pretty progressive, but I don't think that's the only way to do it. And I think that if we can tie in the importance of composting like for the agricultural community and for the regional soil health and how that really impacts our regional food systems. It's a super compelling argument, regardless of political leaning or agenda. Great point. Totally echoed. Oh. Karen, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question <laughs> about, um, a couple of questions about um, the logistics of creating compost. Um, so I know you need your carbon element and a nitrogen element. You have your food scraps and then you need a brown element like leaves or hay or something like that. And I was just curious um, what you do for your brown element. Do you stockpile leaves or how, how do you go about getting that to combine with your food scraps to make compost? And then also um, I was just wondering how can you tell if you have good quality compost because um, sometimes some of my batches I don't get that beautiful crumbly brown result and I was just wondering if there's some kind of standard or way you find out how good your compost is. Good questions. You want to take the first crack Taylor and then maybe I'll talk about the seal of testing assurance. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, so, um, gosh, uh, I would say Monique's going to kind of lead into this, but testing is important. I think kind of anecdotally, um, if you grab your compost and it's, uh, kind of like it in terms of moisture content, it feels kind of like a wet, a dried wet sponge. 
Um, that's kind of, it should be about 60% moisture. If that's helpful. Um, we get our carbon from a local wood company called Durango wood company. And it's really cool. It's organic. He doesn't use any stuff in it, but it's all like wood shavings. So we mix that with our food scraps with a Kubota tractor and um, our piles get up to about 160 degrees. And the composting process is called the process to further reduce pathogen. Um, it's a, a regulated process that all compost facilities kind of have to go through um, in order to make sure that the microbes are um, kind of getting the best um, help. And um, it's uh, 15 days at 131 degrees with, I believe it's five flips. Um, yeah, I think that kind of starts to answer your questions. Home yeah. composting is going to be a little different. So yeah. before you get off that topic, did you negotiate a deal with the wood company? Um, or is it, are you taking scraps for free or are you paying for them? No, so that's kind of the, that's a really good question. This is the neat part, I think about like, the value in the business. So once you get past maybe a little pie in the sky, but the potential is totally there, especially in an agricultural market like Oklahoma to Hannah's point. Um, that's where the paradigm really needs to shift is getting away. But um, I mean, there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, but, you know, we pay to collect the food scraps. We pay, we, I'm sorry, we get paid to collect the food scraps. Um, we get paid to collect the glass and the Durango wood company um, would either have to take his sawdust to the dump and pay for it. And in our case, he brings it to us for free. So it's a sustainable value add for him because he's doing this like morally philanthropic thing that he feels good about. And he's an environmentalist and he's not paying for it. So it's almost like he'd almost even shift that model. And there's been work, you know, I know on the front range in Denver, they'll, they'll charge for collections, kind of like a landfill would. So that's maybe part of the bigger meta thing is like landfill um, fees and what you charge at the landfill and kind of things of that nature. Cool, thanks. Sure. Yeah, it's kind of interesting that we are, in some ways, we're helping to divert waste and save costs. So Durango Wood Company is like, I think it's only a couple miles from the farm. So in addition to being able to feel like you're doing a good thing, I think it's actually cheaper and more efficient for them because they can just drop it off whenever. One of the smartest things that the farmer that we work with said at the very beginning, um, how did this all work? I was desperate. I was bringing like food scraps to my home and I have five acres, but it's all pretty steep. And so I put out an email to the community saying, I need a farm that has like a tractor and X, Y, Z. And the, the canes got back to me and it was so, it's just so funny to look at some of the things that happened in the business that you just have to think there's like some greater, some greater piece at work. Like it's like just, just all the stories, like things came into place and we found the canes and um, Pat Kane is just really, I didn't know at the time, but super smart guy. And, and then at the same time, this entrepreneur that knew me was working for the Durango Wood Company and he's like, hey, we're trying to figure out what to do with this sawdust. So I was like, bring it on. Key thing is that Pat said, you come whenever you want, seven days a week. So it wasn't like, oh, let's schedule it. Like they love it because they just come over, drop it off. There's no limit. There's no logistics. And it was like one of the smartest decisions ever because now we have like endless carbon. <laughs> like we have a like, lot of carbon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So are you, um, so your the land that your facility is on did you purchase are you renting are you leasing what what is that how did that land that you're actually doing the composting on yeah we're leasing it from savannah tree the first year when i was just looking for some place to farm he just let us farm there and then use the compost and now it's kind of turning into more of a you know how do i say business relationship where we're paying him for the tractor he was letting us do everything for free and then he's smart he was using the compost he was like yeah this is a three thousand dollar value to me you just saved me three thousand dollars so so he got that but um but i think now that he sees that the business is growing we're there more we're using more of the space we're moving over to a different four acre 
spot. It's going to be more of an actual lease. And, you know, Taylor and I looked at like, well, we could invest in land and, you know, buying land in the West is always a good idea. But again, it would have been like, well, now we got to come up with some kind of investor who can help us do that. And if it's a 10 year lease and we can just get up and running right away, like, do we really have to own the land? And so I think we, you know, we thought that it was a good solution. And then Karen, you asked something about how to make sure you get like that compost that's the great kind of like it looks right like the black gold um definitely playing around with the carbon source the sawdust is great it's really fine um i think when i was playing around with the piles when i first um bought the business i was playing around with leaves wood chips and sawdust and I found that like, and this is kind of hard to replicate at a large scale. So now we're mostly just using sawdust, but there, there's different um, consistencies that you'll get by the ratio of carbon to nitrogen, like David Golden, um, he didn't put as much carbon in as maybe you could or should, and his was really rich black. Um, the larger wood chips give you a little porosity, so you get more oxygen in the piles. The leaves break down in a different way than haywood. So I guess, it, you know, if at a larger scale you have access to all those kinds of carbon sources, you might play around and each one will give you maybe a little bit of a different result. I think when I was playing around, I really liked the mix of like leaves, wood chips, and then like a finer sawdust. And, and that will also determine like how long it takes for, you know, the organisms to be able to break everything down and when your pile's done and that kind of stuff. But there is a, um, there's a resource from the Cornell lab. Um, that's like a basic, it's from forever ago, like a basic composting handbook that we could send you if you're curious. So. Oh yeah, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought about contacting some landscaping businesses since they deal with a lot of natural waste, like branches that, that are trimmed from trees and whatnot. So I thought that might be a direction I could look. <laughs> Yeah, the branches have a lot of, I think, lignin, maybe Hannah can keep me honest here, but it mm. takes a long time for those to break down. Oh. Like, we don't like branches or, I'm very grouchy about this, we don't like branches or like even stems of flowers. They're just, again, I think it's that lignin content, unless you really like broke them down into super small pieces, they're not going to break down very well. Okay. And, um, yeah. and Karen, I don't know if you have this at your city, but we as not progressive as Tulsa happens to be, we do have a green composting facility and can, we can get varying degrees of mulch for free, which I've gardened with. I haven't mulched. I mean, I haven't like put it in my composting yet, but I've gardened with and to, and it's just free for pickup. So it's something you can also look at too, because I know that they also have leaves as well. Okay. And then I think the other key component to that is that all of those things and the ratios are different depending on where you live too. Um, I was just speaking with the Juno compost operation a week or two ago and it was really interesting to hear that it's so wet there and yeah. their soil is so like, um, the, the way Lisa said it was, we don't have soil here. We have like moss and all these other things growing. Um, and they use a lot of wood chips and that works super well for their particular climate and moisture because they really need that aeration versus like they probably don't need to water their compost as often as we do because it's so windy and dry here. Yeah, great point. Right. That's a great point. Um, Yini, I think, hasn't asked a question yet. <laughs> <laughs> have some questions and I think you covered some of them already. Um, uh, so uh, my question is like, how many staff do you guys have now to support 400 some customers? Uh, and then also like, you know, what are the feedback uh, from the current customer? I'm going to stop here because there are three more questions. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, well, we have one full-time driver. When I first started, Andrea was maybe only 20 hours a week. So it was very part time. And that was at about 200 customers. So if we're almost double that now, it's almost a full time driver. And then of course, Hannah is at like 20 to 30%. And then Taylor's really um, spent a lot of time and energy like building up the marketing side of what we're doing. So we have a lot of contractors that we didn't have before 
professional fees for marketing. Um, we have another person on staff who's helping with sales, but those are all like on a con like a contract basis. So it's still not like a full, you know, it's not like five full-time equivalent employees or anything, but I think we are expecting that once we have a larger facility that that would grow from let's say one FTE full-time equivalent to maybe two to three, but it's been, it's been challenging. We wish that we could have the cash flow to have a, a bigger staff, you know. What was your second question? It's a, the, just the feedback from cus, um, current customers and um, does that drive any like turnover rate? Um... Taylor, do you wanna take that one? Um, so feedback from current customers, does it drive like a, um, like a turnover rate in the customer base? Yeah, so I guess like just uh, just overall like feedback from the current customers yeah. and then also, um, you know, uh, the sub subscriber, right? Do they keep continue to subscribe? Oh. Because, you know, they, they feel positive or yeah. Mm, totally. Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. And I think um, that um, once you start composting, this has kind of been our experience a bit but once you start composting like recycling it's like it can get kind of ingrained um but i kind of answer the question in two parts like on the one side i think customer service is really important for any business and um i know that kind of like we value that piece um and we try to be responsive and accommodate our customers needs and you know kind of cater to everyone's individual uh, wants as best we can and then i guess on the second side um the neat thing and hannah had this really cool idea that we have been able to implement but it's kind of like a streaming service and um uh so like you know netflix gives you a first month for free so we're kind of taking that tack of like okay we're going to give you the first free month try it out um and kind of once you start composting, it's kind of, it's uncommon to stop. We do have cancellations, but oftentimes those people are moving or doing like home composting, which is still great. Obviously we'd love if they stayed with us, but it's awesome that they're still diverting food waste. Um, so I think it's like this neat steady build. So you got to get going, but once you get going, I think it could be pretty compelling over time from like a business model perspective. And then you kind of the last piece is like the soil part of the business is also super compelling. Um, there's really no soil producer in our market. So we're able to really ramp up our production. We'll be able to fill a big niche in this kind of like rural slash progressive city um, uh, market and um, agricultural market. and kind of like, um, I think that also makes the business model compelling, but you got to grow to get there. So we're at this weird transitional phase where it's like kind of challenging, but, um, you know, we're also really fortunate. So I, I hope, I don't know, kind of long winded. Yeah, <laughs> it makes sense. Um, and then some of the questions is like, you know, where are you advertising right now? Um, you know, how you do the marketing and then uh, you know, to the customers, but, and, and also what's your immediate goals, um, mm. I guess for maybe for next year, like, you know, what, where do you see, um, yeah. good question. Um, we're working on a couple different campaigns. One campaign we hope will pay big dividends, uh, is a kind of partnership with the city. We're still working out the details. Um, but we'd like to be on city utility bills. Uh, that gets sent out digitally um, and offer our service and it's kind of we're working on the verbiage but like you know click here to sign up for composting and the city has ac actually graciously offered the sustainability coordinator with the city to pay for the first month's service mm -hmm. up to a certain amount of customers in this pilot program so it's like man if you can get the support of the municipality in whatever market you're in San Diego, if you're going back there, Yinny, 
obviously you probably already have compost operations, but pretty progressive. So I'm sure you could find a good niche. Um, but I think, yeah, that's, that's a current push. And then, you know, um, we do kind of boots on the ground, like door hangers as a marketing approach. Um, lots of social media work. Hannah's doing awesome social media work. And the social media work's been super compelling and like amazing. And I was saying the other day, our Instagram followers have grown from 536 or seven to like close to a thousand now in like the short amount of time that she's been with us. So it's like each person that we touch digitally is really important. And we're trying to create this content market driven kind of model where we want to be thought leaders in environmentalism. So if we can bring as many people and educate as many people around environmental stuff, not just compost, but kind of like a wide range and kind of bring them to our platform, um, that's super compelling and it's lower cost. So that's, that's a neat, um, that's neat as well. And then, um, kind of like public radio is always great. So we're on some public radio, Monique DJ is a radio show at the radio station, mm -hmm. uh, be local radio. And, uh, so we're advertising on that and that's been a cool venue cause it's like kind of that hipster progressive crowd. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think it's pretty much it. And I think the digital platforms are even more um, like a greater bang for your buck right now too, because so many people are staying home and looking for things online. And so that's been pretty cool just to see, I think some uptick in engagement um, that might even just be COVID related. Yeah, sure. Well, I think this is so awesome. One last question probably, and then we can probably try to wrap it up. But why, why the focus on the individual consumer or the in, like the individual house residential versus the commercial versus like the, the restaurants um, in your area? Or can schools, because you they're doing that? schools, I believe as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. Boy, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I think for David, the threshold to get a family household to sign up is way lower than working with the businesses. Um, he, we did have, when Dave first got up and running, I mean, he had like eight or nine businesses signed up. And um, businesses are kind of a challenge because you've got staff coming in and out. You really want to do back end collection, not front end. We used to work with Cream Bean and Berry, who's so, such a great business owner. And she was having the consumer or the customer figure out what goes in the compost piles and using compostable plastics. And we x made that, uh, which is a point to, to share. Maybe we don't take any compostable products, only food scraps. And uh, it just was turning into trash, you know, around the farm. And um, the businesses just tend to be a little bit harder to keep on board, whereas like the family unit it's like there's only so many people in the household they get it it's easy they're really good about what they put in their buckets it's been a little bit harder to get the businesses to stay on board and then with covid we lost quite a few so that was a challenge and then we were working with the 9r school district and of course we lost that because of covid and um one of the grocery stores is now like pausing because of covid so it seems like and maybe taylor has thoughts on this but it wasn't really necessarily like a conscientious choice as much as maybe just again that threshold's a little bit harder um, whereas getting an individual to sign up drop off the bucket just seems to be pretty you know straightforward yeah cool yeah makes sense before we leap off of that real fast though th when they drop off the bucket are they bringing the bucket to you are you you're doing collection so is it going outside and and is there an animal concern it's just a green five gallon bucket is that all we're doing so help me yeah out. they just put it on there you know wherever the recycling bin goes we do have some bear bear proof like um not the leak type bear proof uh kind of covers that screw in um and those are really helpful. I think we've had a couple bears try to get into those and they weren't able to. Uh, we do have a, a bear issue here. So we ask that, that those buckets go to the driveway be, in the morning and then come back at the end of the day. So they're not overnight. And that from a bear safety standpoint, that's pretty good as long as you're not leaving it out overnight. But you are instructing them to put them out in the morning time so that they're not doing that, I see. 
Yeah. How big is your truck? How many trucks do you have? I'm sorry if I missed that. You only have one. We probably need more. It's just a <laughs> four gram with a trailer. <laughs> We're talking about a dump truck and a bigger truck. And Wait, so uh, like describe that, your, your, your rig again? Describe it for me. It's just a Ford Ram pickup truck with a Heapco trailer that fits like, what is it, eight 64-gallon toters in it. It's pretty, <laughs> pretty like... So giant toters that you're kind of filling up the back of the bed with that you're putting the compost directly you're just emptying the buckets directly into that just got it yeah and one of the things we did uh what david used to do when it was only 100 customers in fact i don't think hannah and taylor had to experience this at all i personally had to experience this ptsd we would bring all the buckets back to the farm wash them scrub them and then everybody got a new bucket. And then at some point it was like, we cannot do this anymore. And then we we're like, what do we do? So we started using these bio bags. Forget that. What a bunch of trash everywhere. Sorry. Uh -huh. bio bag. Oh, good. That's good to know too. Cause that. So we didn't, so we weaned everybody off of that. Now what we do that's worked great. Hannah's partner, Chris helped us figure this out and it is awesome. Like, cause I know I've got a drop off site at the bottom of my driveway and those buckets are really clean at the end of every day. So it's just like a sprayer on the back of the truck. And um, we put some wood shavings in the bottom and then that gets things kind of going and keeps it from getting too gunky, dump the bucket and then just spray it with a little bit of water. And then that way you're not using compostable bags. You're just using a little bit of water and pressure. You're not having to like swap out the buckets. David had like the entire back of the truck filled with buckets. It was a waste of space. So some of that. And I think some companies like that one in, gosh, where maybe it's Arizona. I can't remember that they do have bucket washers. Like buckets go back and get like scrubbed. We say now it's like, it's your bucket. You keep it clean. We're going to do a little bit of a rinse, but you you know, do what you want with it. Trash service doesn't do that for you. I mean, well, yeah, it's just true. Like, right. Good point. To take yeah. Your own bucket, right? <laughs> I'm sorry for the brief music that I couldn't turn off fast enough, but I was going to our YouTube page, which I just put in the chat, which has some videos of like the buckets getting sprayed out. Oh, and we give um, customers sawdust too to put in the bottom of the bucket before they put food scraps in, which for the people who do that, I think it helps a lot to minimize smell and keep the bucket cleaner. But you can also see like what the truck and trailer look like and what the compost piles look like and everything. Thank yeah, you. Really cool video. I was just going to say that um, kind of on the commercial piece, um, uh, perhaps for you guys kind of starting off one way, I guess this is just a thought, but one way to like minimize cost, kind of get your name out there. It might be, worth looking into like uh, maybe a coalition of restaurants, um, you know, and having that conversation kind of like preliminarily and get like five or 10 signed up at a rate that'll cover your nut. And then you'll know once you start and then maybe word of mouth could kind of grow from there. Um, just a thought. I'd say on the commercial side too, Monique and I, I definitely agree had that experience restaurants can be challenging but i think there's a lot of opportunity from like a total amount of material diversion potential and a revenue potential with restaurants but covid hit and it was just like a kind of a bad storm yeah uh, obviously not just for us um but the uh i think that that um you know restaurants could be viable maybe when you're starting out and I don't, that wasn't my experience, but it's just, I guess those are kind of just my thoughts. Cause I feel like, you know, with people, there's just this barrier to entry a bit. I don't know. And maybe that's not the case. Uh, some of our best marketing and we've done a lot of analysis has come from word of mouth, our truck driving around people seeing buckets kind of like out there in the streets. Yeah. Um, but there's, there's a lot of, you know, that's kind of a slow build. So if you could start by signing people up, I think that might be helpful or worth looking at. Thank you. I don't want to keep us too long because I also want the video to be watchable and not too long later. Yeah. Either. But I, I do have two quick questions. Can you just talk for a second about, I know you talked a little bit about beer mash. I'm curious about your grocery store relationship and, and how you're getting collecting from grocery stores because I'm sure it's not just a five gallon bucket. And um, whether or not you have, opted out of coffee ground grinds on purpose 
Love coffee grounds. I'll let Taylor answer the uh, how we pick up the larger businesses, grocery yeah. stores. So grocery stores get um, toter like larger toters, uh, sixty-four gallon totes, and we pick them up. The Albertsons that we pick up, we collect um, twice a week, and um, they we average about eight totes. Um, a week, which is about a ton a week of food scraps. Um, but we've got a, a lift gate on the back of our pickup truck. So um, Chris just loads up the uh, toters and wheels it up and takes it back to the farm and swaps out the four that are there with four clean ones. Um, and it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty easy. Perfect. And yeah. then we, I know Monique had to leave for coffee grounds. Do you all collect coffee grounds from coffee cup? Co uh, we do. Yeah. Coffee grounds are great for compost too. Yeah. We love coffee grounds. And do they just get a bucket or are you doing a larger thing for them too? Um, so like kind of like our mid-sized commercial accounts, like grocery stores will get large 64 gallon totes depending on their capacity. Larger accounts, like we're talking to the, the local hospital now, they'll get, um, probably 64 gallon totes as well, if we can get them signed up. Um, but we'll have to pick them up with greater frequency because of regulatory stuff in the industry. Um, beer mash is totally like, we're kind of still working on the logistics, but that's gonna require a completely different type of operation, like big a big tank, essentially mm -hmm. it'll be pretty liquidy. Um, and then we'll kind of spray it on our piles. Um, so it won't be totes, it'll be a you know, pretty sizable amount of material. And, um, and then the smaller commercial accounts, we give uh, 10 gallon bins. So five times two, the 10, just a little bit bigger, we give three to four of those, and we'll pick those up anywhere from one to three times a week. And we find that that's a good place to start for like your commercial restaurants. Kind of like that nice revenue threshold yeah. potential to you between when you figure out your pricing, like, you know, you want to find that nice kind of threshold um, for size as well. Well, I, I know Monique had to go and I don't want to hold you guys any longer. It took a long time to get everyone together today. I will send out an email that has a link to this video on it that's recorded so everyone will have access to it again. And, um, and a thank you. And also, um, maybe we can in a couple of months manage to make this happen again because i'm sure that this this felt like a beginning conversation for us and at the same time we know that you are business owners working hard so um i'll include everyone else who's on this call on whatever request we land on if i can get monique and taylor together again um maybe in a couple of months or so but thank you so much for being so generous with your time and i'm so grateful that that this idea is getting out there and that people are interested in being able to magnify it um not just for sustainability but also just for working you know love your work man work do the thing that that, that you love and that also makes an impact so thank you so much for that um, and thank you for your time. And so I'll send this out, um, email out with a, a link for you guys pretty soon. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you. And then I, have thank a, you. Um, I have a bunch of resources I could share too, even just like other cool accounts to follow and um, yes. other composting operations websites that have some resources. Do you want me to put that in the document that you shared? Do you want me to email it to you? That would be great. If you'll put it in that document we shared, and if everybody would download that, that document, then I mean, you'll have it. I'll just make it open to everybody. That would be fantastic. And then we could go back and find it again. I know that when we get the video, we'll be able to see the link, but we'll have to type it all in. So that would be fantastic if you put it in the document. Perfect. And Thank then I you. think I might just need access to edit it. Oh, yeah. You don't have it. I'll give it to you right now before we Thanks. get off. All right. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Monique. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Mm -hmm.